Hello, everyone. Tonight we're going to hear from Rob Dobbs. He's the non-game ornithologist with the Wildlife Diversity Program at the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fishery. Rob's work involves primarily monitoring of bird species that are of the greatest conservation need and facilitating efforts to minimize the threats to them. He helps implement beneficial measures and he provides guidance to businesses and to the public on non-game bird issues. Rob also is involved with coastal restoration efforts where those concern a bird conservation. Rob himself is an active birder and he's very active in the birding community. He volunteers as an eBird reviewer, leads field trips to Louis up for the Louisiana Ornithological Society, serves on the Louisiana Bird Records Committee, and has compiled several of the Christmas bird count lists. He is especially interested in ver bird vocalizations, particularly he likes to record and identify poorly known vocalizations of, for example, flight calls. Rob lives in Lafayette with his wife, Mary Beth, two young sons, Benjamin and Gabriel, and the family dog, Blaze. Tonight, he's going to tell us about Louisiana Limpkins, which are a recent production. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Check to see if anybody's not muted one more time. All right, Rob, I'm going to turn the lights off over here. We're not going away. We're still here, okay? <laughs> All right, cool. We'll be able to see a little bit better if we turn the lights down. All right, great. All right, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be here tonight to talk to you um, about a subject that I think is uh, really fascinating and also just fun to talk about. You know, we have, as Louisiana birders, Louisiana naturalists, been able to observe a really remarkable ecological event over the last four years. Um, and that is the uh, establishment of a, of a widely distributed and, and breeding population of limpkins, which the species only four years ago had never ever been documented within the state of Louisiana. So it really is a truly uh, remarkable phenomenon. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight for the next 30 or, or 40 minutes or so. <clears throat> and I'm going to start uh, where it all began. So Lake Buff um, in Lafouche Parish, 30 December 2017 on the Thibodeau CBC. Josh Sylvest and his party were, were birding by boat uh, along marshy um, uh, edges of, of the lake and, and nearby canals. And they spotted four uh, limpkins. Uh, they were able to document these birds with via uh, cell phone cameras. Uh, like the images shown here. And uh, this turned out to be the very first documented record of Lemkin uh, in Louisiana. And so, you know, just a side note on, on Christmas bird counts and first state records, this is one uh, in a rich tradition of uh, CBCs turning out first state records. You know, sort of going back in time, other, other notable examples are Pyroloxia, Mountain Plover, Prairie Falcon, Mangrove Cuckoo, Zone-Tailed Hawk, Virginia's warbler, blue bunting, and the list goes on and on. Um, and so, you know, in addition to the, the, the obvious value of CBCs for understanding bird populations, uh, CBCs really are, are you know, uh, uh, an exceptional tool to get out in the field and cover an area well and, and really often turn up, you know, really great birds. Um, so just a little plug for CBCs there, but unlike all those other species I mentioned, which were, you know, one day wonders, or they stuck around a week or something, uh, the vast majority of them never came back to Louisiana, or they haven't yet anyway. Um, this first Limpkin record was the first of many, many Limpkins uh, that we would um, be seeing in Louisiana. And so fast forward four years, back at Lake Buff, again on the Thibodeau CBC, um, Delana LeBlanc counts 32 Limpkins. Um, at the time, uh, to my knowledge, the most uh, that had been found in, in one spot. And so how did we get from four to 32 limpkins at Lake Buff? And what have we seen elsewhere in Louisiana over those four years? That's what we'll spend the first part of the talk talking about. And we'll up ultimately get to the current state of knowledge on limpkin status and distribution in Louisiana. Uh, and then we'll talk about what we don't know about limpkins and some, um, some questions that, that are really pretty, pretty interesting. 
But first we need to talk about uh, what is a limpkin. Uh, limpkins are really unique birds. Um, they have a really unique posture. Uh, they have sort of a bent legged, sort of what's been described as sort of a light footed uh, limping gait, or at least it's been interpreted uh, that way by, by many. And in fact, that's why the limpkin uh, has its name. Uh, they're also really unique taxonomically. Um, Aramidae is uh, a monotypic family. So there is a single genus with a single species, limpkin, within it. And so limpkin really doesn't have a, 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 any very close relatives. Uh, Aramidae is within the, within the order Gruiformes. So the next sort of taxonomic grouping up is, is the order Gruiformes within which uh, it occurs with the Ralidae, so rails, gallinules and coots, and Gruidae, the cranes. Uh, so, you know, a lot of representatives that we're familiar with. And some other uh, families that we, we don't have here in North America, fluff tails, for example, or African rail-like birds, finfoots is another group. That's uh, the sun grebe of the Neotropics is one member of that. And trumpeters, which is a really sort of odd uh, group of ground birds uh, that occur in lowland South American rainforests. Um, but within Gruiformes, Limpkin, Aramidae, that is, is thought to be sister to the Gruidae. So it's most closely related to the cranes, which, you know, really sort of makes a lot of sense, at least superficially. You know, they, they strike me as sort of intermediate in size and structure between rails and cranes. And they share some vocal characteristics with cranes, um, sort of the bugling or rattling quality um, of, of cranes uh, you might be familiar with from Sandhill Crane, perhaps. Um, or, or really, you can hear that in, in a lot of limpkin calls. And so, you know, here is as good a place as any to talk about limpkin vocalizations. Um, they're, they're really unique, many of them, um, loud, uh, really almost haunting calls. One of the most common and characteristic calls are the whales. And, and these are series of loud cries, which can go on for really quite a while. Uh, they're primarily given by males. They're given year round. They're often given at night. And I have two examples here that I think are gonna play over uh, Zoom, I hope. Um, one is a, a short whale series and, and the other is a, a short um, section of a much longer uh, whale series. Listen at the beginning um, because they often introduce these with a softer um, uh, sort of rattle. So I'm gonna see if this works. Did everybody hear that? I'll take, I'll take those, yes. Um, and so each syllable within that sort of has a rising and rising falling uh, crew uh, sound. Um, I'm gonna play uh, the next one. And um, if, you listen, if you listen closely, you hear another call or two in the middle of this one. In addition to the nutria that called sort of near the middle, there were three other calls that were uh, a female type call called a Q call. Um, and females often duet uh, with males um, in these whale series. And I'm gonna play a series of duetting here. And so, so again, there you could again hear that arching crew call, uh, presumably the male, and then interspersed were more nasal, descending shorter cue-like calls, uh, presumably the female. Um, and so, one more vocalization is just uh, a female type call. Uh, they, you know, females give these calls um, in you know different contexts, not not simply with uh, during duetting. And so, you know, this is pretty convenient because, you know, when they're, when they're vocal, uh, these really are loud uh, calls. You can hear them from a long way away. Uh, they're really noteworthy, characteristic. They really sort of jump out at you. You're not likely to miss it if it's, if it's relatively close. Um, and so, you know, 
they're, they're very unique and, and, and characteristic calls. They also give a number of other calls. They give little grunt calls when they're, when they're foraging and when there's nestling or fledglings about, um, uh, there are a number of other little growling type calls they give. But these are some of the more, more um, often heard calls. There are four subspecies uh, of limpkins in two groups. There's an, a northern group called the speckled group uh, or the pictus group. Um, <clears throat> the black line on the map sort of shows uh, where, that, where that break is. Um, uh, farther north in Central America and in the Caribbean and in Florida um, and now Louisiana. That's uh, members of the pictus group. Um, <clears throat> these, these limpkins have uh, white marks that are you know, on, their, on their scapulars, um, uh, wing coverts, um, and they're most pronounced uh, in birds of the pictus group. They're biggest, they're most bold in the, the, actually the subspecies Pictus, which is the Florida, Bahamas, Cuba, and Jamaica subspecies. Um, and the other subspecies, um, Eleucus of Hispaniola and Indolosus of Mexico and Central America, the white marks are there, but they're, they tend to be reduced and the birds in general are, are less of a chocolate brown ground color and more of a, a glossier, darker brown. Um, and then the brown-backed birds uh, of South America uh, lack those those uh, white spots and streaks in the wing coverts and, and scapulars. With respect to ecology, the most important limpkin traits for discussion, particularly for our purposes tonight, is their foraging ecology and diet. So limpkins forage by walking around in shallow water, usually probing around in the water, under vegetation, into vegetation. Uh, they'll also search you know, dry banks um, but they're searching for mollusks uh, primarily, and primarily apple snails. They're apple snail specialists. And so uh, quantitative diet studies, uh, and, and, and these have been performed in Florida. And I should pause and say, almost everything we know about limpkins uh, comes from work that's been done in Florida. Uh, it's really a poorly known species throughout most of its range. Um, but in, in, the, in quantitative diet studies where, where folks have looked at uh, stomach contents, um, the majority of, of what they're eating is mollusks and, and the majority of, of the mollusks are apple snails. Uh, throughout the bird's range, its distribution overlaps tightly with apple snail distribution. Uh, the most important uh, or reliable predictor of limpkin occurrence um, is apple snail presence throughout its range. And it has a specialized uh, bill morphology. If you look at the upper right photo, um, there's a gap in the bill where uh, the maxilla, or the upper part of the bill, and the mandible, or the, the lower part of the bill, don't, don't quite meet. <clears throat> and it's, it's thought that this may function uh, by helping to make the bill uh, work in a more tweezer-like um, fashion, better for grasping a snail, pulling a snail out of a shell. And the other, the other really neat thing about the bill uh, is, is that the tip of the maxilla is curved or bent horizontally, and it's sharp-edged. And this helps the bird get past the operculum of the snail and, and cut or cut the snail out of the shell or, or, or separate it from the shell itself. And so when a, when a limpkin finds a, a snail, it'll take it to land or some very shallow water area where it can manipulate it. It'll place it on the ground with the operculum or the aperture of the snail facing up and it'll often drive a couple of blows with the bill at the operculum itself. The operculum is a, is a hard structure that covers the aperture of the snail to protect the snail, to seal <clears throat> to seal itself inside, basically. And so the limpkin will then insert its, its mandible, its lower you know, part of its bill, between the operculum and the shell, while positioning the maxilla on the outer part of the shell, and basically sort of twist it around in sort of almost a scissors-like fashion, and essentially separate the snail from the shell, and then pull out the snail. There's some really cool videos uh, of this online that I, I couldn't get to, uh, to play in this video, but... Um, Look, look one up, it's, it's probably gonna be more informative than my description. <clears throat> so apple snails are a really important part of limpkin biology throughout its range. And so to really understand what's going on with limpkins here in Louisiana, we need to know about apple snails in Louisiana. Um, apple snails in general are uh, the family Ampullariidae. Ampullariidae. Uh, they're large up to fist size or apple snail, freshwater snails. Um, the family consists of, of nine genera, about 120 species. They're widespread in the tropics, neotropics in Africa and Asia. 
Everything we'll talk about today will pertain to the Pomacea apple snails, uh, quote unquote, the common apple snails. These are neotropical, um, but you know, native wise, um, they have been introduced uh, widely through the um, uh, aquarium pet trade, um, in particular in the US, uh, the aquarium pet trade. They've also been introduced in various places uh, for human, uh, human food source, which sort of has its, its own issues. Uh, that we don't need to go into a lot of, of detail, but briefly, uh, these snails carry a parasite that can cause a, a pretty significant disease in humans. But nonetheless, they've been introduced uh, widely for these reasons, and they're highly invasive. Uh, they are voracious grazers of aquatic vegetation, can seriously damage wetland ecosystems where they're not native. Um, and they are also uh, agricultural pests. They can be uh, rice pests um, and have been in, in, in Southeast Asia, for example. The only apple snail confirmed to occur in Louisiana, to my knowledge, is Pomaceae maculata, the giant apple snail. It's also called the island apple snail. In fact, in iNaturalist, it's called island apple snail, but the species name, the Latin name is maculata. This was introduced into South Florida in the late 1970s via the aquarium pet trade, and they now occur throughout Florida. Um, adults are very difficult to ID. They're similar to uh, the channeled apple snail or Pomaceae canaliculata. And in fact, maculata in Florida was originally thought to be canaliculata, um, but it turned out to be maliculata and ma ma maculata um, is the only species confirmed to be um, in Louisiana. Uh, again, despite being many Pomacea in, in INAT identified as canaliculata. Um, in the, on the Northern Gulf Coast, maculata was first found in Eastern Texas in 2000 and in Louisiana in 2006 in New Orleans where it was it's thought to have been introduced. It now occurs in, I think, 28 or 29 parishes, um, the, the, the southern tier of the state, the I-10-12 corridor and, and you know, adjacent parishes. Homosea uh, eggs are laid in masses above the waterline. Hey, and, mac no. and maculata eggs are bright pink. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is pretty uh, uh, convenient. Uh, it's easy to survey, survey them if you know it, if you know that they're there a lot of times. Unlike the adults, the adults are, are hard to find. They're foraging in the water and vegetation, uh, but the egg, egg masses stand out, um, and the eggs are are much easier to identify to species than adults. There's still a bit of an image in the upper right. Uh, the arrow is pointing at a maculata egg mass. The other pink uh, show sort of the types of substrates that that apple snails deposit their their eggs on. Um, you know, cypress knees, tree trunks, emergent vegetation, posts, concrete walls. <clears throat> but they're very conspicuous. And so now that we know a bit about limpkins and apple snails, uh, we'll go back and we'll pick up the Louisiana limpkin story where we left off. Um, in the next few slides, I'm gonna show the progression of range expansion in Louisiana since December, 2017, or what we know of it, that is. And so it's important to state here that this information is almost entirely generated by community science contributions. Birders and naturalists submitting documentation to eBird and iNaturalist. Um, you know, where that information, can, that documentation can be, can be verified. And so 2017, Lake Bluff. In 2018, uh, the birds remained at Lake Bluff and a different birds showed up at Lake Homa about 12 miles away. In 2019, we started seeing birds in the Gibson area in Western Terrebonne Parish. And in 2020, more and more localities in Terrebonne and the first records for the Maurepas Swamp area as well as a record uh, at a neighborhood pond in uh, Baton Rouge. And in 2021, things really, really kind of blew up. And by the end of 2021, we had records in 19 parishes, you know, documented and verified records in 19 parishes. And in, thus far in 2022, uh, the westward push continues. Uh, we're seeing more and more birds in Northeastern Cameron Parish, and we're seeing the first uh, records for Vermilion Parish. I'm receiving more and more reports all the time 
you know, this map shows verified records through the end of February, but it's really, it's already out of data. I could add a couple more records that I've found in the past couple of days. Um, but it shows more or less the current distribution of known localities. And again, I stress that, uh, that known locality issue. You know, everything that we've described in the previous few slides has looked at localities. <clears throat> Haven't spent a lot of time looking at uh, the abundance uh, information that is also, you know, available in um, some of these data sources. But it did, you know, just some really quick and dirty calculations to give an idea of how abundance is increasing. And this is showing the average group size uh, per observation by year. And so um, <clears throat> in the verified records within the eBird database, um, you know, the number of Lemkins that are observed in any given observation has increased from less than two in 2018, 2019 uh, to over four and a half uh, in 2022. Uh, so, you know, this is, um, again, haven't spent a lot of time looking at these data, but um, not only are Lemkins expanding their range and increasing sort of the spatial, their spatial abundance, but also within where they occur, abundance is also increasing. <clears throat> but I really think that this is only the tip of the iceberg. One year ago, LDWF put out a couple of media pieces, um, one, one web story and one article in, in the Louisiana Conservationist. And this really brought the Lemkin story to an entirely new population of outdoor enthusiasts. And the reports um, really started rolling in. Um, received reports from biologists. The photo in the upper left here is a Lemkin photographed in St. Mary Parish by a, a, a crew of fisheries biologists. Um, received many reports from hunters and, and fishers. So that, that middle photo is, is from a game cam from uh, someone's hunting lease. Um, and, and nature photographers. You know, the, the, the bird on the right there is, was a, a bird that was photographed by a photographer on, on private property in, in St. Charles Parish, I think. And we've even had an injured bird uh, turned in. You know, you know, abundance is really starting to skyrocket when you start getting uh, bird, injured bird reports and, and interactions with, with folks on that level. And so, you know, while while the vast majority of these reports um, were were anecdotal, you know, most of the reports that I've received um, as as a result of those media pieces um, have not been well documented or exact localities. Most of them have been, you know, more anecdotal this general area, um, but many of them seem credible. Many of the, most of them, but not all, are from the sort of the known epicenter of Lemkin density. So Maurepas Swamp, the River Parishes and the Lafouche Terrebonne Basin. Um, but the, the bigger point here is I think that in addition to, and in many ways in contrast to the birder generated knowledge, these new reports are largely from areas that are not accessible to the average birder. These are hunters and fishers that you know, are out in a boat in remote areas, um, they're from private property. And so, you know, this even really more um, uh, begs the question of, of just how many Lemkins are out there and what the densities may be. So that's sort of where we are with, with distribution. Um, you know, but these birds are also breeding. And so almost immediately after the December 2017, you know, Thibodeau CBC discovery, um, in late January 2018, just a month later, Michael Otan discovered a pair of lemkins on the south edge of, of Lake Homa. Um, you know, many of Louisiana's serious, you know, keen birders, um, many folks on, on this call right now uh, saw these birds. Um, this, bur this pair soon began exhibiting courtship behavior um, after they were discovered. Uh, they, copulation was observed 12 February of that year, 2018. And a nest with an incubating adult was discovered on 21 February. And this photo here shows that, that incubating bird as, as discovered, it's buried in the massive giant cut grass here. I'm pointing at it here. And here maybe you can actually see it. You can sort of see the head of the bird and the eye. It's looking to the left um, as we're looking at the screen. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, as far as I can tell, a fairly typical nest site. Um, dense vegetation like that, low, you know, above the water, above the ground, but, but buried in dense vegetation. But they will also nest, um, you know, up in trees. And so this middle photo here um, is one that uh, Maylis 
Prieto uh, took uh, near, near Bayou Black last year. I, I didn't see this nest um, and I can't tell a whole lot of about it, but uh, you can tell that it's, it's up off the ground. It's in either some sort of uh, you know, shrub or uh, lower tree branches uh, themselves. Um, and so they do nest in, in, a, in a wide sort of um, a range of, of sort of microhabitats. I'm aware of three documented breeding localities in Louisiana so far. Um, Lake Homa that, that we talked about a minute ago, they bred there in, in, in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Turtle Bayou in Western Terrebonne Parish, there was evidence of breeding there in 2019 and near Bayou Black um, oh, very in 2020 and, and 2021. Um, <clears throat> in fact, the, the photo of the young bird on the right here, that was taken in July of last year, um, I don't know, five or 10 miles south of, of uh, the Bayou Black Marina. Um, and so, so far in Louisiana, we have records of courtship in February, um, eggs from February to April, and recently fledged young from March to July. And this breeding phenology is, is fairly typical of what is seen in Florida. Um, I've seen notes uh, from Florida about, you know, in years where um, there's, you know, ample water and lots of apple snails that they will breed, you know, most of the year. And so it'll be really interesting to see what, what sort of phenology we ultimately see here in, in Louisiana once we have uh, more information. You know, do, do they breed into the fall? Wow, we don't know. So to put the significance of, of Louisiana breeding events in, in some sort of broader context, there had been one or two extra limital breeding attempts um, in the two years prior to the first Louisiana nest. So in Albany, Georgia, uh, there's, there's a series of suburban ponds that had been colonized by Pomace maculata. Uh, Limpkins discovered that site and they remained and nested in 2016 and they've nested there since. In Alabama, uh, maculata remains confined to the Mobile area, but there's a long established population of introduced Florida apple snails at Gant Lake um, along the Conecuh River in Covington County. Limpkins discovered uh, this site and are thought to have nested there in, in 2017. Uh, there was a pair, uh, courtship behavior was observed, but I don't, I don't think they ever had hard evidence of, of breeding. But in both cases, wandering Limpkins found suitable habitat, a good apple snail population, uh, and ended on ended up you know staying at those sites and and probably breeding or definitely breeding. And then since the Louisiana population became established, um, after breeding had been going on for you know three years, Texas got its first limpkin record uh, last May. And later that summer, copulation uh, was documented there, suggesting that breeding um, occurred there last summer. Um, again, those birds discovered uh, a rich apple snail population. You can see in that photo there that. Foraging limpkin is sort of surrounded by uh, bright pink uh, apple snail egg masses. And there are now limpkin records in Texas uh, in five counties. And so, you know, the same thing that happened here and continues to happen here is happening there. Presumably, or, or possibly an extension, a westward extension of our birds. And so the recent range expansion on the northern Gulf Coast so coincides with a more widespread vagrancy in, in limpkins. Limpkins have long been known to occasionally wander uh, with historical records for Tennessee, uh, Mississippi, up the Atlantic coast to the mid-Atlantic, um, Maryland, Virginia, and even some older uh, reports from much farther uh, Northeast. Um, in the early 2000s, limpkins started turning up more and more regularly in Georgia and South Carolina um, as maculata populations moved up there from Florida. Um, where these birds have been occurring, it's almost always in watersheds containing maculata. Um, but then the frequency of vagrancy really ramped up during the period when the birds colonized Louisiana. So the map on the left is eBird distribution from 2010 to 2016. Um, and then the map on the right shows 2017. I chose that because that's when our first bird showed up uh, to thus far in, in 2022. <clears throat> so in 2019, first state records occurred in uh, Illinois and Ohio. Uh, in 2020, first state record uh, for Oklahoma occurred. In 2021, first state records uh, occurred in Minnesota, Arkansas, and Texas. And additional records occurred in Illinois uh, and Tennessee. 
and so, you know, that's that's really that's that's crazy, um, and it you know it makes me ask the question, you know, what are the source of of these vagrants uh, and the new Gulf Coast colonizers? Um, you know, what's what's sort of the bigger picture of how these birds are moving around? Um, you know, Lemkins have been breeding in Louisiana for the last four years, at least that we know of. Um, it seems likely. Um, it, that you know the Louisiana may be the source population for the the new Texas population. It's impossible to know these things, of course, based on currently uh, available information. But might some of the other you know more wide wider vagrancy patterns uh, also be you know birds that were produced in Louisiana? Or alternatively, uh, the scenario on the left uh, could could be at play in which you know birds keep wandering out of Florida for some reason. Uh, ending up in far-flung places like Minnesota, Illinois, et cetera, Texas, um, and possibly even supplementing the, the Louisiana population uh, that we have established here now. So this is one of, one of many questions that are, that are really fascinating to think about. Lampkins, within Louisiana, it's, it's very clear that the distribution of apple snails is a good predictor of, of Lampkin occurrence, just like it is throughout the, the bird range. And so here I'm going back to the verified document documented records in pink as before. Um, and I've added here in yellow, uh, the apple snail records uh, from iNaturalist and uh, the USGS Nuisance Aquatic Species Database. And you know, there's very close agreement uh, in, in these distributions, exactly what we'd expect. Here I'm, I'm adding on a layer from the National Wetlands Inventory Map uh, to look at habitat associations for both limpkins and apple snails, the dark green this, the really dark green um, is, is uh, you know, um, swamp habitat. It's uh, you know, freshwater shrub or, or forest uh, habitat. The bright green is freshwater marsh and the more blue green is estuarine or marine wetlands. And so, you know, that, those, latter, those latter wetlands, the blue green have, have some sort of uh, salinity uh, associated with them or, or tidal influences. And so, you know, looking at this map shows a couple of things. It validates, you know, what we know about both of these species being limited to freshwater wetlands. Uh, it also raises um, a, a few more questions, uh, such as are limpkins currently in the western upper Atchafalaya Basin? Um, this would seem to be good limpkin habitat, um, freshwater forested wetlands, um, perhaps apple snails, uh, you know, are, are in there. Uh, based on what we know about apple snails on the fringes of the basin, um, but it's just a really a little uh, explored area. Access is difficult, um, and and just you know, birders, and naturalists don't really make it in there a whole lot. No idea how abundant apple snails or limpkins might be in that area. And then farther to the southwest, or are they in the Vermilion and Iberia Parish wetlands? You know, there are many apple snail records um, in the ag areas just north of the marshes there in Vermilion Parish. Um, and at least, you know, a fair bit of that marsh uh, is certainly fresh marsh, um, according to, you know, what we know and according to this map. And it seems like an odd gap uh, between the St. Mary records and, and the, the Cameron Parish records. So is this simply also due to lack of sampling? You know, a lot of these areas are also um, accessible only by boat, you know, or could this also be a habitat uh, suitability issue? Um, some of the estuarine marine areas on the national inventory map, the top map, uh, show as intermediate marsh on the Louisiana coastal veg uh, map, which is the, the bottom map. Both these maps are showing the, the same area from the Wax Lake outlet on the, on the east or the right side to the Texas state line. Um, and so, you know, can apple snails pers persist in intermediate marsh? Um, intermediate marsh typically has a salinity of zero to five parts per thousand. Maculata has been shown to survive pretty well under lab conditions uh, in, in you know, low salinities up to perhaps four parts per thousand. Um, can they do that in the field as well? Um, and then also, you know, a lot of that, what shows up as fresh marsh in, in the top map shows up as intermediate marsh in, in the Louisiana map. So, you know, I'm really intrigued on, on the question of what are the apple snail populations like in, in intermediate marsh um, and are there limpkins there? But those questions are, are not known. Um, we need to get out there in a boat. Another sort of top question in my mind is, uh, will limpkins eventually utilize rice and, and crawfish fields? At least those, you know, 
rice, crawfish fields that have a lot of emergent wetland vegetation, crawfish fields uh, in particular. We haven't seen this yet, and these areas, um, the Cajun prairie, you know, from Lafayette to, to Lake Charles, these areas are well covered by birders. They are intersected by, intersected by um, a vast road network, and we have not, we have not seen them in that, in that landscape yet, really. We are seeing more and more bigger numbers uh, at the northern fringe of the marsh, right on the cusp of that, that wetland uh, ag uh, interface there in northern Cameron and, and Vermilion Parish. And we've seen just a very few birds um, in the very southern extreme of the ag dominated landscape, but still relatively close to the, to the marsh. A lot of concern um, in that region as well, of course, about apple snails um, and impacts to rice and crawfish agriculture. Apple snails are invading these ag lands uh, rapidly. The photo in the top right, which I pirated from the LSU Ag Center website, that's of apple snail egg mass on a, a rice plant. There are fears that apple snails could negatively affect rice production, you know, adults uh, grazing on plants. <clears throat> and apple snails have already had negative, are already negatively uh, impacting crawfish production in, in places uh, in southwestern Louisiana with adult apple snails reducing crawfish yield uh, by entering um, and blocking crawfish traps. So reducing the, the catch per effort basically. <clears throat> the figure in the bottom right uh, shows some recent modeling uh, uh, of apple snail presence in the southern portions of the rice crawfish landscape. Um, you know, they're very, becoming very, very dense in some areas. And this particular work estimated apple snails are moving north um, at, an, at an average of about six kilometers uh, per year. They're moving within this landscape via the Mermintaw River and its tributaries, the Vermilion River, um, and the vast network of irrigation canals and, and ditches. So shifting gears completely, another fascinating question that, that we're all interested in is uh, could snail kites be next? Um, snail kite is another neotropical pomace apple snail specialist. You know, again, its range-wide distribution uh, overlaps very closely with that of pomace apple snails. It occurs as close as eastern Mexico. In fact, Texas has four records. Um, and then there's an endangered subspecies uh, that occurs uh, in Florida. And so this particular species sort of has two uh, routes that it, it could get to Louisiana. Um, in Florida, there's evidence that snail kites are adapting to Pomace maculata, the introduced apple snail that's, that's moved all the way up through Florida and across the Gulf Coast. Um, <clears throat> uh, kite movements and breeding distribution uh, is closing, closely tracking the, the spread of maculata in Florida into North Florida. Um, the kites themselves are ad adapting to larger, the larger size of, of maculata. There was a fear for a while that because maculata is larger than the Florida apple snail that the kites wouldn't be able to, um, you know, utilize uh, uh, maculata as maculata displaced uh, the Florida apple snail. But they're actually seeing there's work actually showing uh, phenotypic uh, plasticity in which the, the bird's bill morphology um, and, and, its, and its body size is changing um, as, as it's been exposed to uh, maculata over the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years. And then there's also some evidence of extralimital breeding uh, in northern Florida, uh, farther north than the typical snail kite uh, breeding distribution that is associated with maculata range expansion. There's also a precedent in western Mexico um, in which northward range expansion by the Limpkin on the Pacific Slope of Mexico was associated with an introduction and establishment of a, a Pomace apple snail. <clears throat> This was followed by the range expansion of uh, snail kite into that same area um, about five or 10, between five and 10 years uh, later. And so this, this was Lemkin range in the late nineties. Um, at that time, Lemkins only extended north or west on the Pacific slope of Mexico to Oaxaca, which is my, my blue area arrow there. This is the Lemkin current, the current range um, of Lemkin based on eBird, uh, data. And you can see that there are, you know, lots of records in, in the northwest part of Mexico, Nayarit to Jalisco to Colima. And this is that area where introduced apple snail populations occur. And now I'm going to shift 
species here, but both maps are going to look almost identical. This is Lemkin and this is snail kite. You can see that throughout its range, much like Lemkin, it overlaps uh, Pomacy apple snails. Um, it mirrors the, the Lemkin range, that is. Um, but, you know, in the 90s, snail kites also didn't get uh, farther west up the Pacific slope of Mexico than Oaxaca. Uh, but now uh, there are lots of records up in Nayarit and in Colima and Jalisco. And so the vast majority of information that, that I've presented today is based on community science. So, you know, I want to take a, a moment and, and thank everyone for submitting eBird records, INAT records, the reports um, that are available, you know, what, what we know is, is only available because of the reports that, that folks have, have submitted. Um, you know, since, since LGWF has put out um, our media releases have received a lot of information that way as well. Uh, but the vast majority of, of really solid um, uh, records with documentation and lat long information comes from these community, community science uh, databases. And so I want to encourage this. You know, Lemkin is not a, it's not a, a species of conservation need or really conservation concern. So there's very little, you know, monitoring that's happening um, in general by, you know, government agencies or NGOs. And so um, I wanna encourage, you know, us, the birding community, the naturalist community to, to continue, you know, submitting this information. Um, and so in doing so, I wanna also, you know, just take a few minutes to talk about identification. Um, Lemkins, you know, I've shown a bunch of photos, but they're fairly large. They're ibis-sized, more or less, uh, long-legged wading birds, um, superficially resemble an ibis. Uh, they're chocolate brown overall. They have, you know, the, the bold white streaks and spots, especially above. The bill is long and it's, it's slightly decurved. Um, this, this photo shows it much better. It's a much straighter bill than, than the ibis on the, on the right. And, and, you know, they are often confused with immature white ibis and with immature and, and non-breeding plumage white face and globia, glossy ibises. But limpkins do have that, that straighter bill um, they have that overall brownish chocolate brown coloration. Immature white ibis has a mix of brown, um, but it also has, you know, a fair bit of, of pale and, and white in, in big areas on its body, not spotted. Um, with respect to, you know, white-faced ibis and glossy ibis, um, again, the triangular large white markings on the back and wings of, of limpkins give it that spotted appearance. Immature and winter white-faced and glossy ibises have thin white streaking uh, on the neck, but they'll, they'll never have that, that bold conspicuous uh, streaking or spotting on the, on the upper parts. And so with that, I'm happy to take questions or uh, entertain any discussion anybody has. You're welcome to unmute yourselves and ask questions if you have them. I don't see any in the... Uh... I got a couple questions. All right. Um, yeah, very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about the uh, three species that um, were have been identified, um, I guess like north of that line of Central America going up, you said it could be done fairly easily phen phenotypically. So I was just wondering, have any studies started to be conducted? Can it also be done genotypically? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, so the, the, I was uh, speaking of three subspecies. Oh, subspecies, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are three subspecies north of Panama, basically, um, throughout Central America, uh, Mexico is one, and then um, one that is Hispaniola, formerly Puerto Rico. I, I don't think they occur in Puerto Rico anymore. And then one in the Bahamas uh, and Jamaica, and that's the one that gets up into Florida and the one that, that we've had um, on the Gulf Coast. And those subspecies are identified uh, phenotypically. Yeah, I don't know if there's been genetics work done on them or not. Okay. And, and one, of, one other question I had was, um, so as the limpkins are coming into these new areas and establishing themselves, are they displacing other bird species or? or other wildlife habitat that we know of? 
Yeah, we we don't have any evidence of that, and you know, I I wouldn't expect that. Their their niche is is so um, narrow and specialized and unoccupied by other native you know animals. Um, no other native birds really eat apple snails. I mean, it you know I, I don't know that it never occurs you know uh, opportunistically, but but it's not known to occur, and. Basically, very few mammals are known to eat apple snails. It's been documented in raccoons and maybe otters, but um, I don't think it's a major uh, component of their diet. So, so no, there's no evidence of that and uh, wouldn't really expect that at okay. this point. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, where were they spotted in Baton Rouge? Oh, I bet Jane could tell us. At Walden Subdivision. Okay. Thank you. It was very strange. One of my students um, said that they had a limpkin in the little pond in the subdivision. And I said, oh, you're mistaken. It's an, a white ibis. And she said, nope, <laughs> and sent me a picture. <laughs> and it was a limpkin. <laughs> is, that, is that recent? Uh, that was uh, two years ago, I want to say. OK. Yeah. yeah. I think there was, it seems like there was another Baton Rouge record, but I can't think of the details off the top of my head. Or at least a Baton Rouge, East Baton Rouge Parish record. I can't think of one off the top of my head. I know they showed up in somebody's backyard in Lafayette. That's true. Yeah. And that one in Jefferson, the injured one was in a mall in Metairie. Mm. So. so if something happens to the apple snails, if we should get like an extended freeze, yeah. Um, that kills off apple snails. Yeah. Um, are the limpkins going to find enough to eat? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, they they eat you know other mollusks. Um, they eat bivalves. You know, birds that that, that wander farther north to the Midwest, um, where you know there are no apple snails. They're they're well known to eat um, other mollusks. Um, but yeah, I have I don't know. I I would expect that we'd see a population. Uh, decline, but uh, you know that's I don't know. Yeah. Well, they they were way up in Minnesota. How did how did they survive? It's so cold there. Yeah, right. Yeah, the, I, I I think that was late summer. I'd have to look. Uh, most of those, um, you know, northern vagrant records are from summer and fall. Um, I don't I don't think there have been many that have been during the. <laughs> um, but they're not they're not staying in those places i hope not we got a question what is the parasite in the apple snail the one that affects humans yeah it's called a rat lungworm um it's a i, th I think i think apple snails are an intermediate host for it and i really don't know the full uh, life cycle of that critter, but uh, yeah, it, it's rat lungworm and it causes something called rat, what is referred to as rat lungworm disease. Um, I don't know a lot, a lot about it, uh, but it, I mean, and it can be severe. It can be fatal. So yeah, if you cook, cook your apple snails well. <laughs> Very well, yeah. <laughs> well done. Any questions in the room? The best way to get rid of the apple snail egg cases? Scrape them off into the water. They, they can't survive in the water, so just knock them into the water. Which, of course, is an exercise in futility at this point. <laughs> right. It right. does make you feel better, though. I know when I go to the Joyce Boardwalk, everyone that I can reach, I'll scrape into the water, even though I can see thousands out there that I can't reach. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Rob, I don't know if you know this one, but what's the appeal for like the aquarium intentional trade of apple snails? Yeah, I don't really know because I, you know, I've heard people say that they're, they're not good aquarium pets because they eat so much vegetation. 
So I don't really know if, if, if they're just sold that way, people get them and, and then realize exactly that. No, these are terrible. They're eating all my plants. I'm going to get rid of it um, or what, but you know, I, I, I haven't really read a lot about uh, what, what's going on in those circles. All right. Yeah. I've been curious. You didn't know. I wonder uh, back to the rat lungworm disease. So what I also see at Joyce is kids, um, leaning off the boardwalk and picking up the shells because they're pretty impressive yeah. and um, probably taking them home. So they're handling these shells without realizing that they're carrying and potentially carrying a disease. So yeah. is wildlife and fisheries considered putting out warning? Yeah, there's a, um, uh, there is, we, the wildlife and fisheries put out a brochure maybe last year. I showed one side of it in my, um, Talk, but um, but yeah, no, there there is a brochure that's available that talks about uh, rat lungworm disease and you know all the other problems associated with um, with apple snails, as far as well, invasiveness. And should post one on the kiosk at the WMA. Yeah, yeah, not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hey, Rob, it's Colette, how are you? Hey, how's it going? Great, thanks so much for doing this tonight. Sure. Um, I just wanna know, and maybe we, I guess you don't know, but how did they know to come here and eat up our apple snails? Mm. Did yeah. one little bird come? I mean, they don't have cell phones. They don't, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I know you talked about vagrant birds so that we get yeah. every so often if they're flown off course or whatever, but it just, it is so um, spellbinding to me that one little bird will show mm -hmm. up and then all of a sudden they all come. I know, yeah, it's amazing. It, yeah, it really makes me, you know, wonder if, if there is something going on in Florida that's, you know, responsible for all these these far-flung vagrants, and that some of them just keep flying by Louisiana and seeing both apple snails and our Olympians and, you know, growing this population. But mm -hmm. yeah, you know, it, I don't, I don't know, but, but it is, we are part of a, a bigger, you know, vagrancy a pattern, like I talked about um, in the last, you know, five years. And do we think anything with climate change has, has anything to do with this? things getting warmer and yeah I don't know I mean you know maculata has has moved up um you know I don't necessarily think it was constrained by climate change and how it expanded in Florida but it's moved up into Georgia um you know into Alabama mm -hmm. into South Carolina and so you know if you know I I don't know how that's related to climate change but uh, it does get back to your your previous you know question as far as birds just sort of uh, moving north and moving north as these as these snails move north um, and then you know once birds are in northern Florida or in Georgia um, you know if they're just sort of you know putting putting together uh, the breadcrumbs and then eventually coming yeah. further farther afield and finding Louisiana yeah it's it's really cool. I think you'll have more every year. You might have to give us a Limpkin update because there'll be yeah, more right? that you learn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It change, it's changing constantly. Yeah, yeah. More information. And hopefully we can get out into some of these um, more more remote areas and, 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 and figure out what's going on in some of these um, areas that are currently just sort of gaps in our knowledge. Wait, are there any plans to start banding any of them? Uh, I, not to my knowledge. That would be fascinating to, to, to sort of track some individual movements, get at some of these questions that we've been talking about. All right, anybody else? I would like to invite Rob to come back when our snail kite shows up. <laughs> <laughs> happily, I'll happily do that. <laughs> Okay, you're on. All right, yeah, that's a challenge for everybody. Go find the snail kite. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll wrap it up there. Rob, thank you again. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's great. Signing off, folks. Thank you again. Go.